Good morning, good morning. Turn to someone this morning and just look at them in the eye and say, good morning. Look at them and say, boy, you look good. The pastor would look better. Go ahead and say it. If he was wearing a mask. See, see, one of the things uh, about masks are, um, some people think that they're made to uh, keep us safe, but I think it's a ploy to help some people look better. <laughs> it is so good to be in God's house today. It's good to have you here uh, to worship Jesus to, uh, together today. There's something very special about coming into this room together. It's, it's different than when we are quarantined at home and we can't go anywhere and we can't go to church and we can't get our hair cut and, and we are going to continue to pray for our country, for our community. We're going to pray that God will find uh, uh, mercy on us as we seek his face. We turn from our wicked ways and we pray to him. I believe God can give us some deliverance. This morning as we are going to be getting into God's word... This is very embarrassing. Can I just tell y'all I'm really embarrassed right now? I'm very, very embarrassed, and this is why. Grant, um, my Bible's over there in my backpack. <laughs> I just said, hey, turn your Bible. Wait a minute, I don't have my Bible. Goodness, Josh, you are never going to come back. You come visit a church, and the pastor don't even take his, his, his Bible into the pulpit. I promise this is the first time this has ever happened. That I've gotten, There's a first time for everything, and it had to be the day that Josh is here. Yeah, I know it. I know it. I tell you what, I just, I just don't know it. See, we're still looking for a good preacher. I, I told you earlier, we're still looking for one. <laughs> oh my goodness, sorry about that. But we are in First John chapter five today. Thank you, buddy, for uh, getting me my Bible for me. That's just embarrassing. That's, uh, that's about as embarrassed as I've been in quite a while. All righty. Hey, pastor, if that's the worst that ever happened, we're gonna be all right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, buddy, for that. Well, this morning, you know, I do come to you because uh, the Lord's laid something on my heart that I think is really important for all of us. Many of us probably are feeling overwhelmed. Many of us are probably feeling like the world is closing in. It is getting crazy. It is upside down. Everything that we knew what was, that was right has turned out to be something different. Things that we used to believe seems to be totally uh, skewed things just seem to be so different now than they used to be no longer are we able to just uh, run in and hug each other and no longer are we able to just go to the store whenever to the doctor now we got to have uh, uh, doctor visits on telephones and we have to see our friends on FaceTime and, and come to church on the computer things are different and upside down and I've got news for you as a pastor I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed and things seem to just be getting uh, more and more in this world. Being overwhelmed is, is hard, and sometimes you can feel like not only are you overwhelmed, but you're overpowered. You're overpowered by things, and it seems like there's no way out. So today, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what God's Word says about our position, our place, because the, the real title for today's sermon, Can I Overcome, is a question that comes from a heart that is desperate, from a heart that is struggling, from a place that you're wondering, is there any way out? Is there a brighter day? Can I overcome all that is happening and all that is going on? So today, open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5 today. That's where we're going to kind of press into this morning and we're going to look into the scriptures and lean into that a little bit to find out what God's word says about that. I hope you come today with an open heart and open mind because God's word will speak. It won't be me. It'll be the Holy Spirit through God's word that will speak to you today. If you come with a need today, if you come with a struggle in your life, God's word will speak to you today in, in 1 John chapter 5. This is some powerful stuff that I want us to get into. Read with me in 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to be reading through verse 12. 
Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Can I stop right there and just begin some commentary? The Word of God says that whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. You are not a child of God unless you believe that Jesus Christ is the Christ, is the Son of God. He died on the cross. He rose from the grave. You are not a child of God unless you've been born again. Black and white, right here in Scripture. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. But this we know. That we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify. The Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of Of men, the testimony of God is even greater. For the testimony of God is this, that He has testified concerning His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in Himself. The one who does not believe God has made Him a liar because He has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning His Son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Father, use your word today to penetrate our hearts. Help us, Father, understand our position so that we can understand our experience, so that we can overcome the things that come our way, that overwhelm us. Lord, we thank you for your word. Use it now in the name of Christ. Amen. This morning, as we look at this scripture, I want us to really press into this comforting assurance that we can find here in these verses. In verse number one, there's something very important I want us to grab hold of today that brings us some comforting assurance that will help us in our everyday struggles of things that come our way. And that is this. We have a family. We have a family. You know, some of us grew up with some family that we don't associate with anymore. I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to uh, confess to you right now. I got some family. We all got them, Pastor. Whoo, <laughs> wee. Oh, me. My, my, my. They don't know Jesus. We've tried to tell them about Jesus. They don't act like they know Jesus if they know Jesus. And we all have some family, and we all have some family history that defines for us what the word family actually means. And for some of us, when we think family, we think, oh my goodness, it's a mess. Or, Gerald, it might be that you think of your family and you think, I I just have a family of liars. (laughs) But it was for your surprise birthday party, Gerald. You know, we have this idea of family, but when it comes to the family of God, there's a different view, a different picture that God gives us. I want you to notice that this family is not based on your bloodline, but Jesus' bloodline. It's what he has done that makes us family. The DNA within us that came from my mom and dad is not what connects me and you. It's the DNA in Jesus Christ when he gave his life for me that connects us as family as brothers and sisters in Christ. So verse 1, we see whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, there's a birth, and whoever loves the Father, there's a Father, loves the child born of Him, other children, which means that there's a family involved here. We belong and we connect. The second thing is, is as we look at this scripture, that gives us some comforting assurance. I want us to look in verse 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. 
See, we often think that we can just love each other and all will be well. But according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, see, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God. Why? How? How is this? He says, when we love God and observe his commandments. We love each other when we love God. We can't get that reversed. We've got to go vertical before we go horizontal. Today, everybody wants us to be horizontal and let's just forget about the vertical. But the word of God points us that our first priority is the love of the Father and God. And that will straighten out the love horizontally. I believe that's one of the problems in our, our communities and our homes and our nation today. Is because we keep trying to love each other and we're forgetting about the vertical relationship of loving God. Because he says here, if we love God, we're going to keep his commandments. His commandments are going to be important. Let's look at verse 3. How hard is his commandments? Aren't they tough? I mean, if, if I'm a Christian, don't I have to give up the fun? Don't I? It's just tough to do all the things the Lord said. Okay, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. In other words, following Christ's commands are not burden, burdensome. It means that there's not a weight on us when we try to follow Christ's commands. It means that it's not difficult and it's not heavy for us when we try to follow Christ's commands. Verse 4. This is where it's going to get good. For whatever is born of God, whatever is born of God overcomes the world sometimes. Is that what your translation says? Is that what your Bible reads as? Does it say that it's sometimes? There could be a possibility. There might be a way for us to overcome the world. It says, for what, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That is a promise, ladies and gentlemen, that we can hold on to. It is a promise that, that gives us the sense of victory. Look in the, the rest of verse 4. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So what is the world? The world is that influence that wants to, to absolutely re remove God as authority, God's word as a priority, God's way as the way to live. It is that, that which we are surrounded with through entertainment and the news and social media and our friends and, and school and all these other places that will take this and just turn it into a book that's insignificant. I'm here to tell you today, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter if I'm popular or not. This is the most important book in the world and this needs to be followed. This is the thing that should set our course, our thinking, and our actions. And so when it comes to overcoming the world, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. If we're born of God, why are we walking around feeling like we're overwhelmed and we can't make it? Well, I believe that we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper here. The Greek word right here for the word overcome is a very interesting word. It's nikeo. Spelled N-I-K-E. Has anybody ever heard of N-I-K-E? Yeah. You have. It is a brand of shoe, Nike. Nike. Nikeo is the Greek word. And it means to overcome. I mean, they got a good brand going on. They say just do it. Just do what? Overcome. The word of God is telling us to just do it. Do what? To overcome. Because we have been born overcomers. Somebody say, I'm an overcomer. Now, do you believe it? Yes. Now, here's, here's an interesting thing. I know many of you have been wondering, what in the world is he doing with that umbrella? You never know with me, right? If today is your first day being in church, you're, if, you, if you come back, you're going to find out. But there ain't no telling what I might have up here or what I might do. Because God's word is so important. If I have to stand on my head to get the point across to people so that they can live a life more like Jesus, I'll do it. So I have an umbrella in my hand. Yesterday afternoon, many of you experienced something that was quite remarkable. It was a sudden storm that came out of nowhere. Yesterday here, and I was here at the church, and I looked outside, and there were some dark clouds, and, and within a matter of 90 seconds, all of a sudden, the wind is blowing, and trees are going everywhere, and it is absolutely a, a mess out there. It was scary. One lady said that she had an umbrella and she got out of the car and the umbrella just turned right upside down. It went crazy. But normally whenever it's raining, what we do is, is we go, you know what, it's raining, so I'm going to take an umbrella. Why do we take an umbrella? 
because we don't want to get wet. Right, Paul? I mean, that makes some sense. So we take an umbrella and we take that umbrella and we put it up when it's raining. Yep, I open an umbrella inside the house because you want to know why? I don't believe in superstition. I believe in Jesus Christ as the one who guides my life. Just want to throw that out there as some truth. So when it's raining, I don't have to get wet because I'm covered over by an umbrella. Other words, I can become an overcomer whenever the rain and the storm is coming when I have the umbrella and I use it. But what if I just decide, I got the umbrella, but I'm just going to walk around like this because it makes me look good, Josh. It makes me look debonair. You know, I can... I can use, you know, you know I, can, I can do that thing up right there, Miss Omi, and I can just walk around and just, yep. It's singing, it's raining, but um, I ain't going to use my umbrella. This is just here to make me look good. I have access to something that will help me overcome, but I don't use it. What would you call somebody who did that? <laughs> Larry just said knucklehead. If you saw somebody walking down the street and it's raining like crazy, Craig, and, and they have an umbrella and they're just doing this, you'd say, knucklehead. I'll tell you, yesterday, when I took a mountain biker who ran to our, our owning over, over here because it was raining so hard, I took them to get their car, and on the golf course down there, there was a guy with it raining like crazy doing this. He didn't have an umbrella or nothing, Craig. Larry, I think that was a good choice word for that. <laughs> but when we see somebody who would have something that could give them the overcoming power to overcome something and they don't use it, we're going to look at them and go, what's up with that? The Word of God tells us here that if we're born of God, we are an overcomer. But the devil wants you to believe there has been no victory over your problem. He wants you to believe that there is no way out from the situation that you're in. He wants to deceive you and get you thinking there is nothing that can be done. It's the difference between position and practice, between state and standing, legal and literal. That idea that we have been born to be an overcomer and then we experience the overcoming. The Word of God says that we're overcomers, but I want us to look in Revelation chapter 2 real quick and chapter 3. I'm just going to show you something that's very interesting. If you've got your Bible, you can just flip to the right to get there. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, it says, To him who overcomes. And you look in verse 11, it says, He who overcomes. And you look in verse 17, To him who overcomes. And then later in that same chapter, in verse 26, he who overcomes. We're reading words from the same author. He says in 1 John, you're an overcomer. But in Revelation, he's saying for the one that does overcome. So how do we reconcile this? How do we put the two together? Because he goes on in chapter 3. Verse 5, he who overcomes. Verse 12, he who overcomes. How do we reconcile that he says in 1 John we are overcomers, but in Revelation he's saying the ones who actually overcome? It's the difference between position and practice. It's the position between having an umbrella in your hand and opening that umbrella up when it's raining and it's a storm outside. It's the difference between saying Jesus Christ is my Savior and saying Jesus Christ is my Lord. Now, I may, I may step on a few toes today because we keep asking God to overcome, Jesus to overcome, but we're just part-time Christians asking for God to do something full-time. We're simply saying, God, I want you to do the great work of helping me overcome, but the only time I'm giving you is Sunday morning at church. I'm going to give you a little time in the morning, but the rest of my life, leave me alone. We will never experience God's overcoming power when we're just a part-time Christian. We have been born to be an overcomer, but we will not experience the overcoming until Christ, we truly believe who He is and what He is, and we let Him be the ruler of our life and be Lord. So here's the thing that we need to 
grab hold of. And that is my overcoming life is found only in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not found in my ideas. It's not found in, in the things that I may come up with or the things that I may say or do. It is only found in a deep abiding relationship with Jesus Christ himself. If you look through verses 5 through 12 of 1 John chapter 5, you know what you're going to see a lot of? It's about the relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about knowing him and in his power and in his strength. That is what God's word is saying here. And we need to grab hold of this if we're going to see overcoming power in our life. See, this is good. We are an overcomer because we join with the one who's already overcome. Maybe, maybe y'all didn't hear that. I'm going to share that again. We are an overcomer because we join together with the one who's already overcome. He's the one who's conquered death, hell, and the grave. He is the one, according to Colossians. Colossians, uh, it, it says in chapter 2, verse 15, that Jesus has dismantled the authority of this world. Jesus came and died on a cross and rose from the dead so that he could. He even declared when he left, and he, all authority has been given to me. He has overcome, and we unite ourselves with the overcomer. Not because we're something special, but because he is the overcomer and we're united with him. So we need to change the way we see Jesus. If we're going to experience overcoming, we can no longer just see Jesus as the little baby in a manger. Dare I say, we have to stop just seeing Jesus as a man hanging on a cross. We have to see Jesus in His resurrected power who brought victory, who will turn our mortal into immortality. Look again in Revelation chapter 1. John, the same one who writes 1 John, gets an, an insight, a vision into who Jesus is. Revelation chapter 1. John, in verse 10, he says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. You want to know what today is? You know what it's called? It's called the Lord's Day. This isn't the Sabbath. It's the Lord's Day. This is the day that Jesus rose from the grave. It's the day that he ascended into heaven. It's the day that the churches would get together and meet. They would meet on the Lord's Day. So John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. What would happen if we were all in the Spirit right now on the Lord's Day? Maybe we would get a vision. Let's look at his vision of what he saw. Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus isn't simply a baby in a manger and a man hanging on a cross. He is the victorious Savior. He is the victorious Messiah who has brought the overcoming and the victory into our life. Because he has overcome, we can overcome. We have to see Jesus as He truly is. Jesus isn't simply someone to just make us feel better. Jesus is the greatest warrior that's ever been. He was there in the very beginning. He was there when Satan tried to overthrow heaven. And let me tell you something. He won then. He won at the cross. He won at the grave. And He's going to win in the future. We link arms with an overcomer. I guarantee you that if, if I had to go up against some of you guys in this room, let's say three of you lined up right here and you were going to charge me, I'd be a little nervous. 
But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to holler, Clyde Emery, come here so I can link arms with you, buddy. That's my son. He's six foot two and he's 285 pounds and he's 13 years old. When I link up arms with my son, I'm not going to be so worried anymore. Let me put it another way. Let's say you walk up to me and you got a gun and you point it at me. You take that gun and you point it at me and you tell me to sit down. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit down. While you have that gun pointed at me, if you tell me to, to pat my head, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pat my head. But just as soon as I find out there's no bullets in your gun, you know what I'm going to do? All of a sudden, the power that you supposedly had is no, no longer got any power. You're absolutely powerless. You had a deception and illusion that you had power over me when the reality is all you got is a toy in your hand. Let me tell you what the devil is doing. He's pointing a gun at you with no bullets in it. He's bringing things into your life to make you think, I have no way out. I have no option. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overstressed. And there's no way that I can overcome this world and what is going on. But let me tell you something. Jesus got the bullets out of the gun. And the devil ain't nothing but a liar. He has got nothing that he can do against us. Because Jesus, he's the one. He's the one who has overcome and has the power. So when you feel like you can't overcome, I want you to just picture the devil holding a gun with no bullets in it. Trying to make you think that he's something. I'm here to tell you today, the devil works in the realm of deception and illusion. He wants you to think you can't do it. But with Jesus Christ, all things are possible through him. Romans 8, 37 says we are more than what? Somebody know it? We are more than what? Conquerors. More than conquerors. Conquering, that's victorious. That's overcoming. That's, that's what I think of. But it, the Bible says we are more than a conqueror. Because of Jesus, Revel, uh, Romans says. John in John chapter 16, verse 33, John recorded Jesus saying these, these words, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have what? Overcome the world. Do we believe Jesus is an overcomer, or do we just believe he's a baby in a manger to make us feel good and look good as we go to church? That is not the Jesus that overcame the world. The one that overcame the world was, was, withstood the worst punishment any man could ever experience. And why did he do it? He did it for you. He was spit at, betrayed. He felt every emotion that's ever possible that you would think you would have to overcome. And yet, and yet, he loved you enough to go through every bit of it so that you can be an overcomer as well. Can you overcome when you know Jesus Christ? You can. Absolutely you can. So what must I do? What must we do? As we look at 1 John chapter 5, it's very clear that if we're born of God, we can be an overcomer. I want us to look in Revelation chapter 12. If you've got your Bible, just flip to the right a little bit in verse number 11. And this is where it's talking about the evil one and, and Jesus. And, and they overcame him. They overcame him because. Who Brent this is good. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb. And because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. There's three things in that verse, Jackie, I want us to look at. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb. 
The Lamb was Jesus Christ. He is the one who was slain for our iniquities. He was bruised for my transgressions. And yet, He overcame, and so shall I. It's because of His blood that I can experience overcoming in my life. Even when I feel overwhelmed and I can't make it. It is the blood of Jesus that makes the difference. It is that relationship with Him that changes everything. The second thing in verse 11, it says, And because of the word of their testimony. Let me tell you something. And I, this, this is going to be hard. So I'm going to go ahead and prepare you. Secret Christians cannot expect the full overcoming power of God to be in their life. I said earlier, part-time Christians cannot expect the overcoming power of God to be filled in their life. If all you we want to do is give God just a smidget of our priorities and a smidget of our time, but expect Him to give us all this great power of overcoming, God is standing there going, I have to be first place. I'd love to give it to you. You have access to that which will overcome that which is coming into your life, but you can't use it. You can't really uh, access it fully until you fully give it completely over to me. So see, if you're a secret Christian, the word of their testimony, what was the first thing? The blood of the Lamb. What is that pointing to? Is it pointing to God or Jesus? Specifically Jesus, isn't it? See, one of our great cop-outs as Christians, I believe in God. God's good. God will help you. The word of their testimony was Jesus is the one that makes a difference. Jesus is the one who brings hope and overcoming in our life. The word of their testimony. They opened their mouth and said something. These are not secret Christians or camouflaged Christians only using the word God. These are, these are men and women who are absolutely using their words. And pointing it to Jesus. If you want to overcome in your life, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Because if we're ashamed of Jesus, how do we expect Him to bring His great overcoming power into our life? We cannot. So, it says, And they overcame Him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. In other words, they loved him so much, they loved him all the way to death. That's a commitment. That's a priority. That's an absolute resolve that though death may come, I shall not be moved. That will bring overcoming power into your life. So the very first thing for us to do is to embrace the life God has given to us through Jesus. We have to embrace that life that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. We have to embrace it to the point where we open our mouth and we'll talk about it. Where we will be the one that will tell of the hope we have. When you find yourself in a conversation and somebody is going, I can't make sense of this world like I did this week. When they're going, I don't know how to wrap my head around everything that's happening. It's one thing, and then it's another, and then it's another thing, and then it's another. You know, my hope is not what's happening in this world. My hope is in Jesus and what's going to happen in the eternal world. And that's how I can keep my head up and keep going. I embrace the life that God has given to me. The life being that which is, comes through Jesus Christ. And the second one is cultivating my relationship with Jesus. That priority. That willingness to go to the place of death for your love of Christ. So where are you today? Are you overwhelmed? Are you struggling? Are you worried? Are you overcome by things of this world? Did you come into this place? Did you tune in today thinking that I just don't know how I'm going to make it through this week. Let me tell you, you can when you know Jesus Christ. 
doesn't mean that all the circumstances are going to change and everything's going to get better, but you're going to have an overcoming power that's going to be able to take you from the place where you are to the place where God can do mighty, mighty work in your life. Here's something for you to try to do this week. Here's your seven-day challenge. I want you to write this down. Sometime this week, write this down on a piece of paper somewhere. Through my relationship with Jesus Christ, I can overcome blank, and you fill in the blank. Because I don't know what it is that you're struggling with in your life. I don't know whether it's something to do with finances or, or relational. I don't know what's going on in your life, how hard or how, how difficult it may be, what you're, you're, you're having to sort out in your mind. But put that in the blank. Because through your relationship through, with Jesus Christ, you can overcome. Didn't say fix it. You can just overcome it. That's the truth of God's word today. It's not about whether we are going to feel better. It's about whether or not we're going to allow God's word to penetrate our hearts today. Let us no longer be secret Christians, but bold to declare Jesus in our life. So that we can experience that overcoming from him. Will you pray with me? Father, today we come to you in the name of Christ. Asking you to help us grab hold of that overcoming power and that overcoming strength that you've already promised to us. Father, right now as people have their head bowed and their eyes closed and they're at home and they're praying. Father, I pray that your spirit will speak into their hearts. Father, if we are to be overcomers, we have to overcome the things that are keeping you from being priority in our life. We have to lay aside those things that we are saying are, is more important than you. So right now, Lord, let us make that commitment. Let us right now choose that this day you will be first. Father, the overcoming is not going to be through our strength. It's going to be through you. Lord, how I wish I could convince more people that the Word of God declares us overcomers so that they could experience freedom like never before. Lord, I'm reminded of Harriet Beecher Stowe that when she was freeing the slaves during the Civil War that she said she could have freed so many more if she could have just convinced them that they were slaves. Lord, your Holy Spirit, convict the hearts of those who need to make a change today. Lord, we have the position, we have the access Lord, we must trust you. Or if someone does not know you today, God, I pray today is the day that they will just surrender their life and ask you to take over their life to forgive them of all the things that they have done. Right now, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, God works where you are, wherever it is, just as much as he does right here up front. But we're going to have... One of our deacons or two of our deacons come forward right now. And we're going to stand. And Larry is going to just lead us in one verse of this song, standing, standing on the promises of God. This today is a promise that we are overcomers. If you need to come and pray today, would you come? Would you please stand? Would you please stand?